Welcome to State & Fig, located in historic La Arcata Plaza in downtown Santa Barbara. Our menu focuses on products that are raised in the state of California, inspired by the flavors of the Riviera. And we are proud to be sponsoring this program. I'm attorney Gregory Lowe. I will prepare your trust, bankruptcy, divorce, conservatorship, probate, evictions. All of this I can do at an affordable price and with caring. Thank you very much. When I was growing up as a kid, I used to go around with him and watch him. My mother and I both worked at Lowry Field to keep on doing this together. Get Conscious Now is proud to be sponsored by American Riviera Bank. It's our bank, and we feel good about it. Hello. I'm Patricia DiOrio, and this is Get Conscious Now, the inspirational, out-of-the-box talk show that helps us to remember who we are as spiritual beings having a human experience and how we can live a life consciously in this chaotic world. This is the first time in 15 shows that we've had an in-studio audience, and I trust impeccably that you were guided here today to be witness to a conversation that we're going to have that's going to be utterly wonderful. So thank you all very much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. This episode of Get Conscious Now is about conscious awakening. Today we're going to take a very deep dive into the spiritual conversation with one of the most renowned spiritual teachers on the planet, in my opinion. Our guest is Reverend Michael Bernard Beckwith, who is the founder of Agape International Spiritual Center in Los Angeles. And we're really thrilled and privileged to have him here with us today. But before you meet him, I want to introduce my wonderful co-host, my charming co-host, Mr. Stu Zimmerman, who has, as usual, his bright smile and some wonderful witty words of welcome. Stu, you want to welcome our audience? I do. Welcome audience in studio and welcome our audience who's uh, watching at home or wherever you are on YouTube. Uh, we are here at Get Conscious now, and, and consciousness is something that extends far beyond our minds to include our hearts, our bodies, and all that we are. So uh, it's as much about opening our heart to greater love as it, e as it is opening our minds up to deeper truths. And if you've missed any of our programs, I'm inviting you to come to YouTube. Uh, we have our own channel called Get Conscious Now. Just search us on YouTube and you'll find us. And find us and friend us on Facebook where we'll have this program and all of our other programs. And we've had uh, Dr. Deepak Chopra on the program and all sorts of amazing people, including Barbara Fields as well from last month. So uh, thank you for joining us now. And Patricia, why don't you introduce our incredible guest for today? I certainly will. It's my privilege. So as a preface to my introduction of uh, Michael Bernard Beckwith, I'd like to share a little personal story. Uh, a part of my spiritual practice, which is really a vital part of my practice, is creating vision boards. And in case any of you are unaware of what a vision board, a dream board is, it's an actual representation of our desires, our hopes, our dreams, our manifestations through visual images, through pictures, through words, through phrases. And it really helps us to be more efficient manifestors. So about three years ago, I did a board on my media work and it was just on my media work, and I put on the board the faces of all the spiritual luminaries that I wanted to interview over the years. And you guessed it, of course, uh, Reverend Michael was right there smack in the center with his beautiful broad smile. So I've interviewed many of the people on this board, and today that manifestation is coming to pass with Reverend Michael, so I'm thrilled to have him here today. And uh, he has the most impressive resume of credentials and accomplishments, and I'm not gonna be able to go over all of them today, but I would like to share a few with you, and this again is just scratching the surface, and forgive me for reading, but I'm going to read them because I would rather read them and be accurate than memorize them and forget something important. So as I mentioned earlier, he's the founder of Agape International Spiritual Center, a non-denominational community headquartered in Los Angeles and comprised of thousands of local members and also global, global live streamers. His humanitarian works have been read into 107th con congressional record, 
and in 2012, he addressed the UN General Assembly during its annual World Interfaith Harmony Week. As president of the Association for Global New Thought, he hosts conferences featuring harbingers of world peace, including His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Reverend Beckwith is sought as a sought-after meditation teacher, conference speaker, and seminar leader in the life visioning process which he originated. Three of his most recent books, Life Visioning, Spiritual Liberation, and Transcend Dance, Expanded, are recipients of the prestigious Nautilus Award. He has appeared on Dr. Oz, The Oprah Show, Larry King Live, Tavis Smiley, Owns Help Desk, and his own PBS special, The Answer Is You. And every Friday at one o'clock on KPFK, Pacific Time, thousands tuned in to his radio show on KPFK, Wake Up, The Sound of Transformation. And today, he's on our show, Get Conscious Now, and we are blessed to have him here. Michael, Reverend Michael, thank you so much for being here, really. Trisha, it's my joy to be with you. Such an honor, you really. Well. Thank oh, you so thank much you for the so invitation. Much. Yes. It's my joy. Really. It's always fascinating to me when I meet a what I call a spiritual luminary or someone who's really embraced consciousness to such a level that you just simply know. What was your upbringing like as a young person? I mean, how did your parents raise you? Where were you raised? And what was that like? And how did you actually find yourself in this amazing well, since Place I don't believe in, in, the, in the past, I don't remember any of that. I'm just <laughs> here with you now. I have no recollection of what happened before today. Of course, I'm kidding. You guys can laugh at that. <laughs> <laughs> um, my father moved us, uh, me and my mother, out to uh, Los Angeles from Washington, D.C. when I was a young boy. So I was raised in Los Angeles. And I was raised, uh, I went to a Methodist church and a Congregational church. I left the Congregational church at the age of 16 because uh, the theology just wasn't speaking to me and became more agnostic. I even called myself an atheist for a number of years. And, and though I kept within me the principles of trying to make the world a better place because uh, my mother was very active in the civil rights movement, so we were very active in participating in making the world a better place, living wages for men, I mean for women and for uh, minorities, uh, things of this particular nature. So I was very active in, in uh, making the world a better place, but I was not connected to any particular spiritual point of view. And um, so somewhere within, so, so being raised there, being raised at, at the Methodist and Congregational Church, I, I left that at, at the, at a, as a teenager. And I went to Morehouse College primarily because that was the uh, alma mater of um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And so it was there that there were some seeds planted in me from uh, Dr. Howard Thurman, who came to speak there when I was a, a freshman. And so those seeds reverberated in me for a while. I, I still was still considering myself to be an atheist. Matter of fact, I had the record for converting Christians to atheism on the campus. <laughs> Why is that surprising? <laughs> we would go out. <laughs> Didn't know they were keeping score. <laughs> <laughs> there was, it was a, this friend of mine who's now an attorney, we would go out and we would come back and compare, you know. Um, I later transferred to USC and it, it was there that um, I had a spiritual awakening. The, uh, it, it, it was preceded by a very dark night in my, in my life. I, had, um, I was a part of a, of, a, of a group that was seeking to change the world. And I can remember sitting in this sitting in the room and this voice said, if you were to take over the world tomorrow, would it be any different? And I turned around to see who had said that, and there was no one there. Mm. And it said it again, if you were to take over the world tomorrow, would the world be any different? So I looked around the room to see who I was in this room with. We, were, we had a lot of revolutionary zeal to change society. And I looked around the room and I could see the territorialism in people, I could see the, the ego, I could see the, 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 the lust for power and recognition, all of this was in the room. And I said, wow, the world would not be any different if we took over. So I left that meeting and never went back. And I didn't have anything to, to fill that, it was just like a big void in my life. And it was a very dark period of my life, so I went back to school. I went to USC, I enrolled and I was in the psychobiology department, I was going to go to med school. And it was at that time I began to have a series of, of dreams that were uh, very lucid and very real. And uh, I began to have these spiritual experiences, but I didn't know what they were. 
I would leave my body spontaneously. I would perhaps like think about my mother and suddenly I'd be in her kitchen looking at her cook. I would get on the phone and say, Mom, are you wearing a blue dress? She would say, yes. Are you cooking chicken? She said, yes. So I knew there was some validity to what was going on, but I didn't know what it was because I hadn't studied any of this. And then to make a long story short, the, the dream I was having culminated with uh, these three men chasing me. Uh, I turned around. There was a small tent with thousands of people trying to get into the small tent, but I knew every person in this, in this line. And I said, these guys can't hurt me. Uh, all my friends are here. And one by one, they turned their back on me. And two of the men held me down, and another plunged a knife in my heart. The pain mm -hmm. physically was excruciating, and I died. And when I woke up from that lucid dream, something had shifted in me. And I could see that we were surrounded by this beauty, um, this, this sacred, everything animate, and inanimate objects were aglow with this presence. And I felt so loved by the presence. And, and I didn't, at the time, the word, I didn't use the word God because I'd come from an agnostic background. So the word that emerged for me at that time was love beauty. I was surrounded by so much beauty and the love penetrated my heart to my very soul. And for a few years, that was my name for the presence of God, love, beauty, and then love, beauty, intelligence. And I began to study the, the uh, sacred books of mysticism. You know, I studied uh, the, the Dhammapada, I studied the, the works of Jesus, I studied Confucius, I studied all of these mystical trends and realized they all met at the center. They were all saying from their own cult cultural and historical perspective, pretty much the same thing, that we're connected to this divine presence. So, so then the word God crept back into my, my language, but not a God in the sky, not a man, but a presence that's never an absence. So that's a, that's a short version. And wow. it, took, it took a number of years of integration. So I was very, uh, I would call myself at that time, I was kind of airy-fairy. I was uh, so into the light and the luminous and, and the, the connection. I wasn't any earthly good necessarily, except for my vibration. And um, so it took a number of years of integration to be able to integrate that awareness and embrace my human incarnation. Because when, when you're in that kind of light and luminosity, the incarnation, human, it wasn't that meaningful for me. I was wondering why people were concerned about money and why were they concerned about dying? No one ever dies. It was, it was, um, so it took a while to integrate and really embrace being human again. And so now there's a nice, integration. I love, I love being human. I love the integration of the human incarnation. I love the divine presence. And that's a beautiful story. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's story. my life. Yeah, that's yeah. Wow. Your life. Yeah. How old were you when that happened? I was in my 20s. In early your 20s. 20s. Yeah. It was yeah. the last, last year of uh, attending USC. I think if anyone ever thought of you as being an agnostic or an atheist, they would be totally stunned. Right. Well, you know, the theologies at that, I, I couldn't buy the theology yeah. at, at the mm -hmm. time. It was too uh, distant, the presence of God was a God that needed um, anger management, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, right. right. He was pretty angry at times. Yeah, and he, he had Jesus being the buffer between God and him. It was just too weird. And separation. <laughs> this whole idea of tremendous separation. Tremendous separation, yeah. Tremendous separation, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Well, we're here today talking about uh, conscious awakening. So let's uh, start by defining our terms a little bit, right. both in terms of uh, what it means to you uh, to be conscious. And from the awakening piece, what are we exactly awakening, or are we awakening from something, or awakening into right. something else? Yes, I think it's a combination of both. There's often um, the talk that there's three kinds of awakening. There's the, the awakening that takes place when you go to bed at night, and you sleep, and then the next morning you wake up fresh, hopefully fresh, you've had dreams. But you, so you awake, you awake into this dimension. And then there's the awakening that takes place when you, when you die, when, you, when, the body, when you're evicted from the body temple and an individual discovers that they weren't the body, they were, they're still conscious, they're still alive. That's a, a second kind of awakening. And the third kind of awakening is when you wake up and have a, a realization that you're connected to life, you're connected to God. That's the kind of awakening I think we're talking about. For it is possible to die and still be unconscious, mm -hmm. you know, and still uh, feel a sense of separation or be caught in small worlds. 
And so that's the second kind of awakening. But the third kind of awakening, you're awakening from a sleep into an awareness that you're connected uh, to this, this presence of life and beauty and intelligence yes. that has always been. So it's both an awakening from sleep and awakening to the activation of your real connectedness and real potential. Mm -hmm. and, and conscious awakening uh, is when we, we're at the stage of our, 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 our unfoldment, our evolution as a species, where we have to consciously participate in our own unfolding and our own awakening. It's not just going to happen through evolution and mm -hmm. hundreds of years and one day we're all going to be awake. We have to actually give ourselves permission and actually practice and actually have an intention and actually participate in our own unfolding. And that's to consciously awake, to know that there's something more to us than meets the eye. And so we're consciously making ourselves available to that. And now more and more people are doing that. You know, it used to be, I mean, you mentioned meditation 30 years ago, and it was kind of woo-woo. Yeah. You know, now meditation is a catch word for athletes and salespeople and, you know, sure. school teachers. Mindfulness, yeah. Yeah, so mm -hmm. it's, we've evolved as a species. What, what would you say, if you, if you had to come up with an, a number, let's say, a percentage of people on the planet that you might think would be consciously awakening right now or you know in this conversation that we're in today how many people well, I think you, there's, there's, there's millions and millions of people who are in the conversation I mean just the, the billions of dollars of, of revenue that circulates around seminars and around uh, conscious awakening books and things like that particularly in the Western worlds um, so there's millions of people who are a part of the conversation uh, practicing yoga qigong meditation studying uh, things of this particular nature uh, and the percentage of people who, who are actually awakening you know is a much lower percentage but their vibration makes a big difference on the planet right mm -hmm. the resonance yeah. yeah so there is a resonance that happens from people who have who have awakened right. to their potential and there's millions of people out here that know there's something more than uh, greed and uh, trying to stockpile money and, and, and right. awards on, on, on the Abuse wall. Abuse and violence yes. and all the, the yes. so there's a lot of keep us separate, yeah. Absolutely. When you think of the 1% that's talked about, you know, the 1% on the planet with all of the money, you know, I think that there's a comparable, maybe more than 1% of those of us that are in this conversation, that agree. through the resonance of our intention for awakening is probably much more powerful than all the money I would agree. That could be in, yeah. in that the That percentage world. is much higher than, much than 1%. Percent. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's not interested in hoarding. <laughs> no, they're yeah. interested in circulating and yes. sharing. Right. Yes. And that's what happens when you begin to wake up. You go from trying to get to seeking to let. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you're, you're allowing uh, your potential to escape and to express, as Robert Browning would say, to allow the inner splendor to escape rather, th rather than get, because you're not run uh, by the ego sense of separation. You're now run, as you were saying earlier, right. You run more by your heart. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So I'd like to ask you about the founding of Agape International Spiritual Center. Um, many, many years ago, I had heard the term agape in relationship to a church, and I was just wondering if there was any connection to another movement or if this was your specific creative no, it, brainchild. Before, uh, what does, I, and also, what, what does the word agape mean? Well, the word agape means unconditional love. Oh. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. described it as the love of God operating in the human heart. Oh. And so as a, as a, as a child, we, we would listen to Dr. King a lot. And uh, I can remember his talk on agape love, where he would differentiate between the different kinds of love, uh, friendship, motherly love, th this type of thing, and romantic love. But the highest form of love was the, the agape love which is an unconditional, all-conditional kind of love. You, you don't love people simply because you like them. You love people because they're made by the presence of God. And right. so, I, 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 and so I, 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 was, I had a, a, a something called agape transformationals. And agape came from the influence of Dr. King, and transformationals came from the influence of Malcolm X, because he had transformed himself uh, from a criminal uh, uh, to an individual who became a, a lover of all humanity in one lifetime. And so he was an, an example of, of being transformed. Mm -hmm. And so I put the two together and wow. started Agape Transformationals. And then when uh, I gave up the resistance of starting a spiritual community, I named it Agape. It's a very basic uh, explanation 
uh, when we talk about good, we're not talking about um, uh, the, uh, the human con concept of good. It's actually a capitalized all good. Uh, the, the God is the, this presence that's never an absence cannot compromise nor contradict its own nature. And its nature is life. And so when, when, when individuals ask, for instance, what is God's will? The will of God is always for a greater expression of life, which is all good, uh, 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 an enhancement of beauty, of love, intelligence, order, elegance, these particular qualities. So that, and God is life. There's no separation between the presence and life. So therefore, life is good. Now, individuals' experience of life may not be good, exactly. but life itself is good, you see. Like somebody can have, uh, be thirsty. It doesn't stop the wetness of water if they're not <laughs> drinking it, you see. Just because ah, they're thirsty that's a good metaphor. doesn't yeah, mean that metaphor, water yes. is not wet. That's right. So just because an individual is not connected right. or conscious yes. of the presence yes. doesn't mean the presence isn't, isn't operating. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, that's a great explanation. Thank yeah. you. Stu and I had fun going over the principles and practices, you know, and, and a lot of our questions today came from that. So I'd like to address the second principle of agape, which is God is omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, and omniactive. Yes. Would you address that, please? Yeah, these, these are uh, descriptions of the presence of God to the best of our, our ability. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about an omnipresence, we're talking about a presence and that is everywhere in its fullness, not bound by time nor space. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and this presence um, is always being itself. It's omnipotent, which means it's the, really the only power that there is. And oftentimes you'll hear people say things like, you know, he or she was speaking truth to power, you know, when, they, when they, they're speaking up for themselves. or speak. And I always say, no, they're speaking truth to pseudo power because there's only really one power, and that's the power that's eternal and forever. Everything else is transitory. And so there's one power, and that power is om omnipotent. Omniscient means all-knowing. So this power is conscious, and it's, it's not just intelligent, it's intelligence, mm -hmm. you see. So this presence is yes. intelligence everywhere. And omniactive, meaning that it's really the only game in town. It's it's a uh, it's what it is, it is the energy behind evolution. It's yes. it's the energy uh, behind everything. It behind everything, even what we would call chaos, right. is really the birth of a higher order of being. Right. And underneath that is the life and the intelligence and the omni activity of the presence of God. So those are four O's. People used to talk about the three O's. You know, uh, 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 omnipotent, omniscience, and, and omnipresent. Then I added omniactive. <laughs> it's the only game in town. And so. It's just a description to the best of our ability of this presence that's never an absence. I wonder if it's also omni-amorous. And, <laughs> and by that I mean it loves yes. its creation. Yes. You know, I think that this is a very good point because people have creation stories. And for me, when that uh, uh, event in consciousness took place for me, I realized that the presence of God, this presence, did not create out of loneliness, this presence of God created out of bliss and ecstasy, so overflowing with love and beauty and joy uh, that the cosmos uh, burst into creation from an overflow of what God is. Mm -hmm. And so and this, so this presence was not lonely. Some people will say, well, God was lonely. You created all these people. No, <laughs> that's ridiculous <laughs> because you can find beings who are alone who aren't lonely. Right. Yes. So if you can be alone and not be lonely, then the presence of God uh, a lonely can be, the, which is all one, can be one alone and not be lonely. So we, the creation story is a burst of life from the overflow and bliss and ecstasy uh, is how we all got here. Mm -hmm. Wow, but a new, a new re rendition of the Big Bang Theory, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it reminds me of a story, but I don't think I'll share it now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, you sure? Well, no, you just remind me of a story about, a, about a, 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 a classroom in which the teacher had been teaching about science. And uh, so she asked the class, what is, what is the universe? And she'd been teaching that it was a living organism and this type of thing. And, and one little girl said, well, it's one big orgasm. And she wanted to say organism. <laughs> and the teacher said, that gives a whole new meaning to the Big Bang Theory. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> oh, that's a great story. Thank you for sharing that story. That's but, but you know, this idea of, uh, of God, the divine, the, yeah. the source of all things, whatever 
uh, label we, we, or name we call it, in, in its ever presence. Yes. Uh, we also, it also seems to show up through us each individually, uh, rather uniquely. Yes. And uh, I noticed that one of the principles that you have for, for Agape International is this notion of each person having their own responsibility. Yes. Uh, for, their, for their awakening and evolution. Yes. Yeah, you, you use three uh, very powerful words, individual, uniqueness, and responsibility. Now this presence that is infinite, that's another name we can place with mm -hmm. the presence, never repeats itself. Everything is unique, every fingerprint, every snowflake, every leaf on a tree, every rose petal, even though it may be of the same species, is a unique expression of that. And so we're, we're unique emanations of the presence. We're individuals. Individual means undivided. So we're undivided, unique expressions of this great presence. And so, it is up, so responsibility means the ability to respond. So each of us are cultivating enough spaciousness within ourselves through mindfulness to have the ability to respond to our real nature rather than react to a circumstance. And so to the degree that we have spiritual practice, have a degree of spaciousness within us that, that reaction is not the order of the day, but response is, we begin to, to be able to have choice. Choice is a function of expanded awareness. And now we're a part of our own unfoldment. We're responsible for it. Uh, oftentimes people equate responsibility with obligation. It, it's a, it becomes a very heavy word, mm -hmm. I'm responsible. Mm -hmm. But it, it just means the ability to respond to something. Just like a, an, an artist uh, can respond to beauty and, and bring out a beautiful portrait or a photograph or a composition. You know, we can respond to love and our heart opens and there's compassion and forgiveness and patience. You know, we learn to respond to the presence within us, consciously, regularly, systematically, consistently, and then uh, our, our potential unfolds. And just like the rose in the right condition manifests its full potential, we, in the right condition, that we help create through responsibility, mm -hmm. we unfold and our potential is actualized. So those are, those mm -hmm. are powerful words. Uniqueness, mm -hmm. individuality, and responsibility. Mm -hmm. Very, very important. Thank you. So every one of us, then, is an individualized expression of God. Absolutely. Right? Which is one of the principles. And in, in that particular principle was the term made in the image and likeness of God. And when I read that, there's something that stopped me because it, it brought me back to my upbringing as a very, very staunch Catholic. And in my understanding of God and church and all of that as a little girl, uh, God was not in me and I was not one with God. God was out there, up there, separate mm -hmm. and calling the shots. Right. And we had to go to confession and commit, you know, and, and talk about our sins and all of this. So. To me, when we were told that we were in the image and likeness of God, it didn't mean to me that we were God. So I guess the question I have here is that it, it, either we are of God yes. in, and the same yes. as that, because an image or a likeness is looking in the mirror, but it doesn't mean that's who we are. Yes. It's just an image of who we are or a likeness of who we are. So I found it surprising to see that expression in there. Well, right? let me tell you what it means. Okay. First of all, you talked about us being one with God. and. and we're, we're one with God, similar to a wave being one with the ocean. Right. You can't have the wave without an ocean. Exactly. Or the sunbeam is never separate from the sun. A sunbeam is an emanation of, of the sun, sun, and each sunbeam is unique. Made so of the same stuff. Same stuff, same brilliance, luminosity, heat, all of that. So we're emanations of this presence. And so when I say image and likeness of God, I'm, since God is formless, we're not talking about looking in the mirror and saying, oh, God is looking good today. You know? <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about a spiritual faculty that we share with the presence. So the image and likeness of God, the faculty that we share with the presence is that we can think independent of circumstances. You can think. Right now we have a studio audience here. We're talking. Something can, something can be going on in their life that's not good. Maybe a diagnosis. Maybe they just got a call that a friend is sick. But they can sit here right now and think independent of that and release a prayer. Uh, uh, they, can, they can think about something positive happening for that person. So that's a faculty that allows an individual to think independent of a circumstance and thus set something new in one's life. Now, 
uh, all animals in the animal kingdom, they're, they're conscious. But the faculty of thinking independent of a circumstance uh, is very highly developed in us. Right. You know, if, if we have a dog here, dog is beautiful, conscious, love, the tail wags, it represents unconditional love. But if you were about to throw a rock at this dog, the dog's probably going to run away or attack you. It's probably not going to go into a full lotus position and contemplate compassion. It's going to do one of two things. But as a spiritual being having a human incarnation, someone can hate me. I can think independent of that and give love back. I can give forgiveness. I can give compassion. I can radiate kindness. So that's a faculty of the presence of God that we have. So when you read with the image and likeness of God, I'm speaking about that faculty okay. that allows us to again participate in our own unfolding. Because it would be pure hell if we were bound by circumstances and conditions and the past and past perceptions, but we're not bound by that. We can think independent of that. I'm talking about real thinking, not mentation, right. not rehearsing or regurgitating of old thoughts, but a real thinking coming from inspiration and insight we can actually change the course of our, of our life and embrace a powerful destiny. That's the image and likeness of God. That's what we have within us. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for clearing that up for me. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. You won't find that in the Bible. No. Okay. <laughs> but you'll find that well, in my books. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which some people consider a Bible of sorts. Some people do. Yeah, yeah. they do. Yeah. There clearly is a great mystery on some level of what this infinite truly is. Yes that as much as we would possibly love to be able to understand it fully and define it right. and understand completely why we're here and what this particular incarnation right. is for, I do wonder that there is this perhaps greater divine plan on, or some cosmic dream that we may not be aware of as to kind of why we're in this global uh, situation that we're in in the moment. Mm -hmm. You know, with all of the, all the love, all the joy, all the hate, all the abuse, all the violence, all the legacy of separation that shows up in a, a variety of social ills. Right. How can we uh, kind of reckon and balance the two? Because there's clearly something going on that seems to be beyond our control. Right. Even as we seem to have complete free will and choice, which implies some measure of you right. know, well, control. I, well, you use the word, first of all, you use the word mystery, which, which I love. Uh, and we can't control. Uh, the mystery allows us to be aware that we must remain as a child, and we must remain, not childish, mm -hmm. but must remain uh, with that beginner's mind. So we're always available to more insight and more revelation and more understanding. And whatever it is that we think we know is infinitesimal to that which we don't know right. because this presence is, is infinite. So if we live in that space, then there's a, a, a kind of a sweet surrender that we live in, a, a, a sweet availability because we don't know it all. You know, even though we may have insight and know this presence, we still don't know. So mystery, I think, is beautiful to, to live in that space. So then when we look out in the world of effects in the world of circumstances and conditions and situations, we can see that a lot of the conditions are actually a condensation of perception. If individuals are, are perceive themselves separate from the presence, they, they're living in a world of scarcity. Mm -hmm lack, limitation, separation, their actions, sometimes very selfish, greed, lust, hoard, hate, and that creates all manner of conditions. And if you have individuals who are uh, participating in that, creating conversation around that, agreeing with that, you create whole cities, whole worlds with that as its perception. Yes. So uh, I separate the difference between the world and the planet. Planet Earth, beautiful, mostly water, a lot of green, foliage, rainforest, even though they're being destroyed by the greed of humanity. That's the planet. The world is made up of conversations and agreements mm -hmm. that become perceptions, perceptions that then become experience. Mm -hmm. And that is why we can say that as many people as we have, they're all living in a different world. 
Right. You know? Right. You, right. Seven you billion perceptions. So all these different perceptions. <laughs> yes. So you go, you know, you can take two different people standing on a corner and one saying, oh, this is terrible. You know, whatever is going on. Another person says, this is beautiful. Look at all the opportunity that's here. You see, it's all based on perception. So when I look out at the world, I'm not oblivious to the fact that there's mayhem, that there's wars and rumors of wars, that we live in a country that stockpiles weapons, uh, trillions of dollars of money go into weaponry and, and, and prison industrial systems and, and uh, media uh, uh, forging a narrative that numbs the people uh, to becoming conscious so that they can control them and go into wars that aren't necessary. I'm not oblivious to that, not just in our country, but you know, countries around the world that do very similar, uh, create similar narratives. Uh, I'm not oblivious to that, uh, but I'm also aware that it's not the final truth. I'm also aware that there's no empire that's ever survived, that that's not an integrity. You know, I'm also aware uh, that all of that's transitory. So when you talk about balance, the balance is one foot in the eternal, the presence, and, and the other foot in the world giving your gifts so that you find your place where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. So you're doing your thing. Uh, where there's, if, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe your thing is to, to, to be a part of the, the, the language that articulates a reverence for planet Earth. So we're not uh, having oil spills all the time and not tearing down the rainforest or the, or the rivers or the oceans. Maybe your place is in uh, medical where you're, you're, you're bringing new ways of healing. Maybe your place is in education. Maybe, maybe your place is in uh, redeeming individuals who are in prison. But everyone, you know, so you walk in the internal, you get your vision, you get your assignment, and then you come into time where, okay. the, where the stuff seems awfully nasty. Yeah. And you find, you hold your vision while you're walking in time. Right. Mm -hmm. So literally the eternal uh, gets infused in your step, in your language. Mm -hmm. And what I discovered is that people who don't have a foot in the eternal get burnt out. Mm -hmm. right. You know, the, the, many of my activist friends get very burnt out because they'll look at mm -hmm. things in the world and it's so ominous, you know, but they haven't caught necessarily the vision. Mm -hmm. Spiritual activism. Right, yes, mm -hmm. and that's what, you know, as Association of Global New Thought, we speak about mm -hmm. spiritual activism. Mm -hmm. yes. And so you have to have both, and that's where the balance is. Because if you're too far, if you don't embrace your human incarnation and you're too far in the eternal, you won't be any earthly good. Exactly. Mm. And if you're too far in the world, yeah. even, even if you think you're a change agent, but you're not run by a vision, then you get burnt out, you're upset, you're angry, mm. you become right and righteous. Mm. Right. So there has to be that, that, that balance. balance. Yeah. But it's, um, See, we're doing good, really Patricia. We're, yeah. doing, we're, doing we're doing good doing, here. We're you, doing good. You guys are well, doing good. <laughs> <laughs> life is good. God yes. is good. Well, you know, I... Um, my goal in life is to find my balance between my humanity and my divinity, and, and that's really what I endeavor to teach uh, as a spiritual counselor myself. Uh, and, um, and, and yet, I, I think it's really the hardest work that we're ever going to do. It's certainly the hardest work I've ever done. And um, I, I was very moved by hearing you speak a couple of years ago uh, at a small audience for you. There were only about 200 people of, in, the, in this hotel room in, in Los Angeles. And you were up there with Ricky on the piano behind, and you, I, I can remember you wearing a suit, and you were wearing these toe shoes. Yes, <laughs> I, I still wear the toe shoes. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought it was really, really sweet. Anyway, you talked about when you were, I don't know exactly where you were in your own awakening process, but that you were really serious about getting it done. I mean, you were really serious about awakening, and you put mattresses in your garage. Oh, you're right, right, right. right. And, and they were, I'd, I'd like you to share about that, because you did a lot of work in that garage. Yes. But the, the piece that really stunned me was that you had a mirror there, mm -hmm. and you, stud, you stood in front of that mirror, and you spoke in the first person, the second person, and the third person yes. regarding being God. Right. You know, would you share that with us? That was yeah. such a beautiful thing. Well, I was speaking to the fact that, you know, this, t the, the, this takes, you were talking about the work that it, that it takes to yes. really become conscious and yes. grow. This is not wishful thinking. No. It's, it's not, you know, just wishing that you're going to grow and unfold. You have to actually participate in your own unfoldment. So at that time in my, in my evolution, I was, it's in my 20s, I think, I'd had the, the awakening. And I, I, I put mattresses all around my, this garage I had, mirrors, chairs. And I would go in there on a daily basis, and I would do inner work. And the work consisted of 
one uh, using what, I, what is called emotionally backed affirmations. Mm. And that is taking the raw emotion of anything that would come up, mm. anger, fear, resentment, whatever, using that emotion, but using it to tell the truth of my being. So sometimes I would have chairs lined up. And I would imagine that there were these people sitting in chairs that were, had a strong authority. They were, they, they considered, uh, I considered them the authority figures. Maybe they didn't like me. Maybe they made me feel bad about myself. And I would speak to them about who I was. You know, I, Michael Beckwith, am. Then I would look in the mirror. You, Michael Beckwith, are. You're, 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 you're fluent. You're articulate. You're powerful. You're, you love yourself. And then I would speak about Michael. He, Michael Beckwith, is. Because those programs, programs are in our mind. We're, we're programmed by saying, I am. We're programmed by saying, you are. Mm -hmm. We're programmed by saying, he is. We hear those voices. So I would change those voices. And sometimes I would use it uh, with emotion, sometimes not. So the mirror work was there. The chairs were there. The mattresses were there so the neighbors wouldn't think I was crazy or in there beating up someone. Oh, I thought you were bouncing off the walls or something. <laughs> you know? And so I'd meditate. I would pray, I would affirm, I would write, and, and really start to shift the subjective tendency of my mind. Mm -hmm. And so it was real work. And so, you know, for anyone to think that, you know, Michael Bernard Beck would just arrived one day, you know, I did work. You did work. You know, yeah. and still do work. We have to do work. All yeah. of us need to yeah. do work. Yeah, exactly. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that story. How long did you do it for in okay. the garage? I mean, I mean, I mean the whole, yeah, using the garage as your kind of your, your oh, workshop. Oh, a few years. A few years. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was mm -hmm. maybe longer, as long as probably was, I was in that house. It was, mm -hmm. it was a part of my ritual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember one time during the summer, uh, there were some guys that came over. We were meditating and praying and beating the drums. And all of a sudden, it started hailing in the middle of the summer. It just hailed in our neighborhood, you know. We're like, what that is was going sign. on? <laughs> I don't know if we caused that or not, but I always remember that particular day. Well, you know, same, <laughs> people are saying up. the same thing about the weather here in Santa Barbara now, which yeah. is 90 degrees as we're, we're filming this. Right, and right. Typically, it's a little more temperate, and rumor has it that the, you know, the heat that you're bringing here and the light is well, kind of helping to raise the temperature by a few notches. I thought I'd help out a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I do that for weddings, but it costs a little bit more. <laughs> I'll do the wedding, but if you want a good day, you got to give a larger donation to it. <laughs> there you go. There you go. There you go. Uh, let's talk about forgiveness as a practice yes. that could truly help us in our, our conscious awakening. Uh, I've heard you speak about forgiveness, and to me it was uh, in not ordinary terms. So why don't you share your thoughts on forgiveness and the role that it can play in our, in our awakening? Well, forgiveness ultimately, you know, must be a way of living in which just as I, I'm, I'm aware that when you make your transition, you know, uh, and you have your life review, you, you, you look over your life and you forgive yourself and embrace yourself and applaud yourself for right choices. That needs to be done on a daily basis. When you go to bed at night, to a certain degree, you just look over your life and make sure you're not holding any resentments, animosities, even for yourself. You've blown an assignment, you said the wrong thing, you could have done something much more kinder. So you're not creating a lot of um, a residue around unforgiveness. So all forgiveness is really self-forgiveness. Mm -hmm. So even if someone uh, did you wrong, so to speak, and if you're holding on rancor, resentment, animosity, those are thought forms. Mm -hmm. And those thought forms That's are not cool. inert, they're not neutral. Mm -hmm. uh, they begin to create a condition for disease, they create a condition for the, the, the blocking of creativity, creative thinking, create stagnation in one's life. So even if you think you're forgiving someone else, you're really releasing the rancor and the resentment out of your own soul right. so that you can be free. So, uh, so I, I think that makes it a little bit easier for people. They're not letting someone off the hook if they said something about them or did something about them. Right. You're actually taking yourself off the hook right. Right. And, and cleaning your own consciousness up right. so that the, the, the river of spirit can run freely through you and not be stagnated by the pollution of, of, of rancor and resentment. Right, right. I remember you saying that it was really almost uh, like a, a declaration mm -hmm. of personal power to free yourself energetically. Yes 
from a particular event or circumstance. Absolutely. Whether it involved anybody else or just yourself. Well, you're taking your power back. Yes. When you're, when you're living in unforgiveness, you've given your power of happiness and joy and bliss and ecstasy to someone else. Away. They're holding it. You're also uh, saying, this is a very important point where forgiveness is concerned. You're saying that someone owes you something. They owe me an apology. They owe me forgiveness. They owe me something. Mm -hmm. Therefore, metaphysically, you're telling the universe you don't have something. And so you're mm -hmm. vibrating now. So you're, right, saying, so you're, you're not whole. I, I'm yes. not whole and yes. I don't have. Right. So that shows up mm -hmm. as an experience of lack and debt. Mm. Mm -hmm. So sometimes yes. people are in debt because they believe someone owes them something and they don't have anything. So it frees you from debt consciousness. Mm -hmm. Forgiveness opens up the window to receiving so many blessings. Mm -hmm. Health, wholeness, healing, abundance, creativity, and, and ultimately when we do hear like the teachings of Jesus, um, who was not a Christian by the way, you know. <laughs> he was a Jewish guy, right? He, he was a wonderful <laughs> Jewish rabbi that was enlightened. Um, said forgive 70 times 7, which means make forgiveness a way of living. Yeah. See? So self-forgiveness is really like self-love. Yes. Right? Love, forgiveness is self-forgiveness and mm -hmm. That's love where it is self -love. ends up. Self-love and self-appreciation, which however is the beginning of our step, our path to conscious awakening. Right. Self-love is the beginning step, not yeah. the end. And not mm -hmm. something we're taught. Right. Yeah. So our time is flying, but I have to get this question in. I want to ask you this. Um, I want to talk about the possibility of physical immortality. And <laughs> <Really>? I know <laughs> And I know that of course, you know, we're immortal beings and yes. we're evolving and our soul is evolving. But given that I'm a huge fan of Dr. Bruce Lipton and he says that our thoughts are creating our world. Our thoughts are informing the cells of our body. What we yes. think about the cells of our body um, is really what happens with our body. And he said, unfortunately, we come in and we're immediately hooked into the paradigm of aging, disease, and death. Yes. So that's where we're headed, to, to, to death even as infants. And my question to you is, do you think it's possible if we can truly own our power and truly be aligned with our divinity and to pay attention to what we're thinking about in regard to how we're informing ourselves, that we could live exponentially longer than you know, the, what, what the average oh, lifetime absolutely. is. No, there's, there's, there's no doubt. Bruce Lipton is a friend of mine as well. I've yes. had him on my radio program and, you know, we're, we're buddies. And he's basically put in biolog evolutionary biological terms right. the teachings of the mystics. That, you know, he talks about uh, the antenna that's on your cell that hears your thought, that yes. ultimately your cell and your DNA begins to shift according to your attitude and your moods and your right. perceptions. Mm -hmm. Well, the mystics have been saying this for, for, for thousands of years that when you develop a level of coherence with the fundamental harmony of existence itself, then you create the condition that releases tonic chemicals mm -hmm. rather than toxic chemicals. Mm -hmm. So your body is no longer a cesspool of, of disease, it becomes a flowing river of life and beauty and love and can heal anything. The body can heal anything uh, uh, when the mindset is correct. The difficulty is, as you indicated, we're born into this, this world that first of all has the belief of death, dying, and disease. Right. It's toxic in terms of what we're breathing. It's not as much oxygen on the planet as it used to be based on factory farming and uh, emissions from cars and factories and things of this particular nature. The food is not what it used to be 25 years ago. You can eat an apple and get all your vitamins. Now you have to eat 25 apples to get the same amount of vitamins 25 years ago. So there's a lot of things, but if all things being equal, individual, uh, was, was in alignment with the fundamental harmony of the universe. Um, proper nutrition, whatever that body temple needed, proper hydration, proper exercise. You could extend the life of the body if you wanted to for many years longer than the average. Absolutely. Yeah. And immortality is definitely a possibility. Yeah, great. Yes. Thank you. Yes. You're the first person that has acknowledged. Now, that's not true. Bruce Lipton did. I asked him that question. And he said, yes, you know, yeah. if a person can truly believe it and be aligned with their divinity in yes. that capacity. With God, all things stay. are possible. That's with right. God consciousness, all things are possible. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God, we're winding down. I can't I believe know. it. It seems like five minutes went by. It, it felt exactly like five minutes. Five yeah. minutes. Oh. If we could just do a very quick Extremely quick. Now, you're going to be in Santa Barbara for the film festival in the October? The Association for Global New Thought Transformational Film Festival. It's right here in October. I've got the dates right here. 
right. October 27th through the 30th. And this is very important because in our day and age, um, the new uh, mosques and synagogues and churches have become the movie theaters, where people gather and they, these, these ideas flood their minds. Sometimes it's about greed and the lowest common denominator of the human experience, not necessarily transformational. This is a transformational film festival in which the films that will be there uh, uh, will inform a higher order of being. Mm -hmm. Inspiration, transformation, transformational knowledge, creativity, and will be with people in which, you know, people want to hang out with. It, it's, right. a, it's a wonderful fellowship. It's a sangha mm -hmm. of spiritual transformation, allowing the film to be the medium of inspiration. Right. It's going to be good. They want to be there. And I think it's the first one in the world, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know if it's the first transformational film festival. It, I don't know. It might be. I don't want to go out on the limb on that because then <laughs> no. we'll get all kinds of Me letters. Me but, uh, but it's going to be a good one. Yes. Yeah. Right. Wonderful. Wow. And you also have an event we want to share about that coming up at the end of the year. We well, every year I do, a, um, I do two meditation retreats, at least two meditation retreats a year. Uh, and so we always do one at the end of the year, a few days before the New Year's and we go through the New Year. So people come in from around the world and in their year with us in meditation. I teach meditation. We have uh, individuals that teach yoga. Uh, Ricky Beebe brings about the chant vibration. And uh, it's a very powerful transformational time for people. That's wonderful. Uh, so they can go to agapelive.com agape and, and see right. all of that. Yeah. I'm going to ask you for a pearl of wisdom here in a moment to address our in-house audience and also our viewers. But I have to ask this question as well. Do you think it's possible for us to experience in, in our lifetime heaven on earth? I do. I do. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I'll sign up. <laughs> well, I think the key word, the key word is realization. We can have a realization of, of heaven. And heaven, the word heaven from the Greek means expanded good. So mm. heaven is ever-expanding good. And so when we are, have a level of coherence about that which is real, you can be in heaven right now. That's right. Right now. Yeah. And then if you and I agree, you and I agree, the people in the audience agree, the people that are watching this program agree, it becomes contagious. That's right. And yeah. we live in heaven yes. now. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? Why yes. not? Why That's not? Right. That's why we're exactly. here. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. That's great. Well, what would you share if you had something to sum up this show, which has just been one of my favorites so far? To sum up the show? <laughs> to sum up the show. Uh, to sum up what our conversation, what would your pearl of wisdom be to our viewers mm -hmm. and to our audience? I would look at the viewers and I would, I would tell them right now that within you is so much good, so much infinite potential, and that this presence never does a do-over the presence got you right the first time. And there is so much beauty and love and intelligence. And the world needs you to be you. Wake up and be you. Yeah. Wow. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's my You're joy. just a wonderful <laughs> thing. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank all much of you. for being with us today. It's my joy. And now it's time to hear from my illustrious co-host, Stu Zimmerman, with his rendition of Stu's Views. Stu? That's because nobody else has a rendition of Stu's Views other than me. <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> That's right. So here we go, <laughs> Stu's Views for this time. And I've been kind of watching TV recently, which I typically don't do. But there's been a show that's kind of intrigued me called Utopia, which is a social experiment uh, someone's vision of a reality TV of throwing 15 people again, uh, together and see if they can create a world uh, out of the love and inspiration that they have for existence. So for this week's Stu's Views, we're going to go with Stu-topia, if you don't mind. <laughs> and very specifically, yeah, yeah, and, and it's a follow-up to what uh, Reverend Michael uh, Beckwith was sharing with us about heaven and this notion of expanding good. So Stu-topia is really a vibration. It's an energy of delight and joy just simply to exist in the moment. And it feels like this infinite thing that we've been talking about, some will call it God, which is ever-present in all things. It just feels absolutely delighted to show up in our skin and bones and be able to dance around in this dimension. 
knowing full well in its infinite knowledge of all of its intangibility and all of its uh, formlessness that it gets to play around in this particular form known as you <laughs> and me and all of us. And it is such a sense of delight and beauty and wonder of all of creation that we get to embrace each other just like we heard about in some fairy tale. And we just get to love each other. I just got to say thank you that it's such a blessing to be incarnate and such a blessing to wake up and that we give ourselves permission to let God, the universe, whatever it is, just have its way with us and just to say, yes, I love my creation of it through me, through you, through us, through all of it. And it is so friggin' delightful. <laughs> yeah, just breathe with that one for a little bit, and uh, now it's time for Patricia and her quantum quotes. Thank you, Stu. I love that. Take it away, sweetie. Yeah, Stu's view is always fun. So I think the, the most fun that I have around my segment is the research piece. And I just love reading inspirational quotes. And as a matter of fact, I always have one of my outgoing messages on my phone. So if you want to be inspired, give me a call. <laughs> uh, so today, I decided in light of our wonderful guest, uh, Reverend Michael Bernard Beckwith, that I would select one of his quotes. So I just put his name in, Googled his name with the word quotes, and up came, voila, all these sites with these fabulous, awesome quotes from Reverend Michael. And these quotes speak directly to my heart, and they inspire me to listen for the message. So what I'm asking you to do now is to listen for the message in this quote that I'm about to read. And here it is. The you of you is not you of your credentials. If, however, you are stuck in your personal history, you may become a credential collector believing that you are defined by your business cards and degrees. Instead, attune yourself to your inner voice whispering, wake up. It's time to be free and to step into your true identity as an awakened being. That is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Wow, and you know how I chose that quote? By the goosebumps and the God bumps that I felt. Every time I read it, I felt these chills going up my spine. And you know, I always listen to my body. Our bodies never lie. So this message is so very important for us to take on a very deep level because we all live in a, wor in a material world that is very seductive. And we define ourselves by our outer world, by who we are, by the degrees we have, and particularly around money. Mm -hmm. Instead of being aligned with that inner world of richness where everything and anything is possible. So what I want to say to you today is wake up to your true identity as a God being in physical form. Wake up to your power to create your reality personally and collectively because when we do it collectively we can change the world. Right? Yeah. And be a deliberate creator. Wake up every morning and create your day. End your day with going, doing a mental uh, run of your day to see what it is you need to clean up before you go to sleep. In my opinion, the spiritual revolution is well on its way and it's gaining a lot of steam. All right? So recognize who you are, own your power, be a deliberate creator, and wake up because it's time. And that's it for our show today. With that, so with that, it's time. It's time. It's Until time. next time, we have a great message for you, and that is Get, get conscious, conscious Now. Welcome to State and Fig, located in historic La Arcata Plaza in downtown Santa Barbara. Our menu focuses on products that are raised in the state of California, inspired by the flavors of the Riviera. And we are proud to be sponsoring this program. I'm attorney Gregory Lowe. I will prepare your trust, bankruptcy, divorce, conservatorship, probate, 
evictions. All of this I can do at an affordable price and with caring. Thank you very much. When I was growing up as a kid, I used to go around with him and watch him. My mother and I both worked at Lowry Field to keep on doing this together. Get Conscious Now is proud to be sponsored by American Riviera Bank. It's our bank, and we feel good about it.